Yeah, we're back with another Jazz Matters podcast, and our special guest is B. Russell Malone, guitarist extraordinaire, along with, of course, the infamous Vaughn Coulter from Jazz Beats Radio. I'm Edwin Williams uh, with Jazz Matters. Before we get started, though, uh, go to uh, yesjazzmatters.org is a website where you can learn more about me as well as what Jazz Matters do. Uh, but also on the on the pages uh, over there where we have a, a, a store where you can get apparel, you can get even a few items, coffee cups, mugs, whatever, you know, it's all in the Jazz Matter store. It's some pretty good stuff. A lot of the quotes that are that are on the apparel are definitely mine, <laughs> you know, and as well as uh, donation. Uh, you can click on the donation tab and uh, Donate because that's the best nation in the world. Donation, don't let nobody fool you. It's the greatest nation in the world. Now, with Russell over there, since Russell is a heavy dope person that donates to causes like ours, which is the 501c3, we're going to definitely have him go to the site and click on the donate button and donate at least a million dollars. And <laughs> at, least, at least, at least a million, you know. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and uh, Get this thing kicked off. Now, Russell, we can we can do this two ways. We can do it hard way, or we can do it the easy way. I prefer the easy way because the hard way, we don't want any bones and stuff rattling around where skeletons are falling out and everything behind from behind. We, we, don't, we don't want that definitely. And and, and that don't look that don't look good on Zoom. <laughs> but me and, me, and, me and Russell kid all the time. Even you know, even from all these years. But anyway, uh, Russell, go ahead, man. And uh, I mean, I can say that and get away with it, Russell. I don't think many other people can. <laughs> you know. But the thing is, uh, Russell, go ahead and uh, let everybody know where you're from and and uh, how you got started in music, as well as how you uh, continue to make the music uh, business your business. Well, I was born in. Uh, and raised in Albany, Georgia. My birthday is November the 8th, 1963. So that would put me at, uh, I'll be 59 this year. Now, now the police not looking for you, are they? Huh? <laughs> no, the police aren't looking for me. No, no, no. <laughs> you gave up too much information. That's the TMI. <laughs> TMI. Yeah, but I, um, I started out playing uh, music in the church back home. And... Uh, the first time I saw, well, actually, let me let, let me let me let me start here first. I always had a love for music, and um, I remember the first music that I that I heard was the old church mothers in the church singing these gospel songs, singing these hymns, and uh, it was so moving. Even at the age of uh, three and four years old, I was aware of the different types of emotions and. Um, reactions that you could get from playing music. That, that always fascinated me, you know? You know what, uh, Russell, since you said that, that is, that is a thing that, uh, I'm glad you said that, as a matter of fact, that I've told people that many, many times, uh, when you start out around music mm -hmm. as a child, especially a very young child, you end up channeling those vibrations. Yes. So the vibration that stay with you a lifetime, especially if you were one of the channels for I have a lot of brothers and sisters that uh, they didn't channel it the same way I did. You see what I'm saying? That's what that's what I realized that there's something different in each and everybody and everyone. You know, when you expose to certain environmental, you know, and cultural things, you know, everybody will channel it differently. Those that uh, continue to stay with that vibration usually become artists musicians and so forth and so on. But go ahead, I didn't mean to cut you off, but okay. No, that's okay. That's, that's okay. No, but that 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 was the thing that um made me fall in love with music. Just well first of all the music. Uh, it wasn't the most sophisticated thing that I, one might be accustomed to hearing, but it was just so much feeling. And um <laughs> like I was saying like I was saying earlier about how you would get these different reactions. Some people may cry, some people I've, I've even seen people who become so consumed by the effects of the music that they start, they'll run. Right. You know, yeah, it was just, mm -hmm. that, that was just so interesting to me. And um, right. then later on, the guitar was eventually added 
uh, incorporated into the uh, the church services. But before that, people uh, would clap their hands, and there there there's just so much rhythm. There was rhythm all around us. People would, they would clap their hands. Uh, there was one lady in the church. Her name was Mother Collins. Oh, she's long gone now because she was old then. But I remember her mm -hmm. taking a washboard with a coat hanger. Well, back in the country, wow. they, call it, they call it a rug board. But she, she'd right. take that washboard mm -hmm. with a coat hanger and she'd be beating out these rhythms. I even see, remember seeing a lady with a pot and a spoon, you know. And then there was the drums, of course. And uh, all of this rhythm, and, 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 and they were making music out of these homemade makeshift instruments. And then later on, the guitar was incorporated into the church services. And uh, I remember the first time I laid eyes on the guitar, we came to church one Sunday, and I saw this weird looking instrument, which was perched up against one of the pews. And then I noticed that there was a cable which uh, extended from this little hole into this box, which was the amplifier. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like, man, that's really that's a really an interest, really an interesting looking device there. And then this old man, and I still remember his name. His name was Johnny Will Williams, who I never got to meet, but I remember him. I can see him just as plain as day. And he picked up the guitar, and he started to play. And as soon as I heard that sound, I knew that that would be the tool that I would be using to express whatever feelings I was feeling inside musically. That's what I would be using. That was, that's what I would be uh, using to express myself. And so my mom mm -hmm. noticed that every time we come to church, I'd always find myself over in the corner listening to this gentleman play or whoever was playing, because there were a lot of guitar players in the church. He was the first one that I saw. So um, mm -hmm. she noticed that I was always paying attention to these gentleman played the guitar when we, whenever we go to church. So one day she came home from the supermarket of where she'd been shopping. And uh, you know how it is when your mother, when you were a little kid, when your mother would come home from the store with bags of things, you wanna know, well, mama, what did you get for me? You know, and that's, I remember following her, following her into the kitchen. And she uh, asked, well, mama, you get anything for me? And she pulled out this little guitar. And I remember getting real excited when I saw it. I said, oh, that's the, uh, the, the guitar that the gentleman was playing in church. That's what he was playing in the church. So, and I remember it was this ugly shade of green. It was a green guitar made out of plastic and it had red strings on it. But I didn't care because that's what I wanted. That's, I mean, that was my heart's desire to have a guitar. So I remember her taking it out of the, uh, out of the package and she gave it to me. I didn't even tune it up. I didn't know anything about tuning up the guitar, but I remember holding it up to my up to my chest, and I was mimicking the way that I'd seen the other guys um, utilize the instrument. And I remember strumming it, and I'll never forget the vibrations that I felt from the uh, mm. instrument into my body. And and to this day, Edwin. I still get the same feeling. It, 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 it has not gotten old, man. I still get the same feeling when I pick up the guitar. And so uh, one of the guys in the church, um, and, and, and by the way, I'd take that guitar and I'd be strumming. It wasn't making any music. Well, it was music to me. But I must have, I must have driven my mom and dad crazy because I was just strumming, walking around the house strumming. So fast forward, one of the guys in the church showed me how to tune it. And... Um, it wasn't the regular Spanish tuning that um, has become so popular. It was that it was an open D, open E tuning. You should call it Vasapu. Vasapu, that's man. Don't too many people know about that, but it was Vasapu. That's how I first started learning how to play. Yeah. And uh, it took so you way I, uh, back then. I'm sorry. I took you way back then. <laughs> yeah, the Vasapu. Nobody knows about that, man. Right. And then so uh, and I had one, had a, I remember had uh, uh, having a thumb pick because I didn't uh, know anything about the flat pick then, but it was a, I started out with a thumb pick. And uh, I eventually started playing in the church when I was about six years old. And then there was a, uh, in fact, the, the lady who showed me how to tune the guitar, I'm still in touch with her now. She was also a guitar player. Her name was Ida Mae Baker. Came over through the house and showed me how to tune that guitar. And uh, I eventually 
learn how to tune it in the regular way. One of the guys, one of the other guys in the church, in the church showed me how to do that. So, uh, but that's, that was my start in, uh, with, with the guitar. And then, you know, there was uh, the music in my house. My mother played songs, played records by this. You ever hear a group called the Dixie Hummingbirds? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, when, yeah. I was, when I was young, I used to actually go see them. My father was also on that circuit playing with the Sensational Nightingale. Yes, yes. I heard all that music when I was growing up. The Dixie Hummingbirds, the Mighty Clouds of Joy, the Fantastic Violinists, Slim and the Supreme Angels, the Jackson Southern Years. And speaking of the Dixie Hummingbirds, about four or five years ago, I got to meet and become really good friends with that guitar player, Howard Carroll. In fact, the very first solo that I ever learned how to play on the guitar was, uh, that, that I ever copied, was, uh, was Howard Carroll's from a song called Standing by the Bedside of My Neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, but that's how I started, man, the, the, the gospel music, uh, the, the, the gospel keynotes, who I got a chance to play a gig with down in uh, Albany, Georgia, when I was still living there. Oh, okay. Yeah, man, but the thing that really turned me on Two revelations. One was seeing B.B. King on TV when I was uh, a kid. I saw him on a show called Sanford and Son. I know y'all remember that show. Oh, yeah. Sanford and Son. And B.B. King was a guest on that show. And he sang a song called How Blue Can You Get? And um, the thing that resonated so strongly with B.B. was the, well, first of all, the sound that he got out of, get, out of that guitar, man. I'd never heard anybody play with such a stinging and biting tone like that. And then when he started to preach, I mean, when he started to sing, it sounded like um, the way that uh, it reminded me of how my minister would deliver a sermon. So B.B. King, a very uh, significant part of my uh, early development. And then uh, the way I got turned on to jazz was through George Vinson. Uh, I was about 12 years old. And I saw George Vincent on television one night. It was a school night when I should have been up. I should have. I should not have been up. I should have been sleeping. But uh, I remember seeing George. I had no idea who he was at the time. But I was flicking the uh, the channel. Remember when you used to have to turn the? Uh... Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Man. Exactly. It was. Oh, we remember when? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> PBS PBS station, and it was on. Yep. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I see this guy, I saw this guy sitting on a stool playing a guitar that I, I, I first of all, this, this, the, the, the appearance of his, guitar, of his guitar got to me. I was like, wow, I've never seen a guitar like that. It was a big hollow body guitar. I never had one of those, never seen one of those before, but I, <clears throat> um, I liked the way it looked. It was really interesting the way it looked. And then he was sitting on this stool I still remember what he had on. He had on a black polyester leisure suit, a black shirt with a big wide collar. collar. Wide, this is wide 19, collar, yeah. This is it's 19, the 70s. This is 1975. I'm 12 years old. Right, now. it's the 70s, yeah. <laughs> no right. Big wide collar, and then he had uh, white polka dots in the shirt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he had an afro. And when I first saw him, I thought that George, I thought it was Lamont Sanford because they look very much alike. I said, man, Lamont Sanford playing guitar? <laughs> and they announced his name and it was George Benson. And he was right. playing some of the most incredible things. I was like, whoa, man. And that was when I figured I'm going to try to play like that one day or get mm. in that ballpark. And so, uh, and mm -hmm. the rest of the guys in the band, um, but I remember... Teddy Wilson was playing the piano. I didn't know who they were, right. but they later wow. on. Wow. Teddy Wilson on piano, Mel Tinton on bass, Papa Joe Jones was playing drums, and Red Norville was playing vibes. And they were doing, they, I found out later on that they were doing a salute to Charlie Christian because Charlie, and Benny Goodman was playing. Uh, yeah. Right. Was playing wow. Piano. Wow. And, 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 and yeah. We talked about this a long time ago. A long time ago. We both saw that program. <laughs> we talked about it. <laughs> You both yeah. believe because when you brought it up, I say, "Oh, yeah, I remember exactly what you were talking about. I remember the program and everything, you know." And you told me, you told me that, when, uh, and I didn't really pay attention to this until years later. But you, were, we were talking about this, and you told me about how um, when George was playing, about how he really took Benny Goodman out. He really, oh, he, I mean, he took him outside the back and whipped him good. You told me about that, man. And then I, you know, years later. I met George and, and, you know, and we talked about that. 
yeah. he told me he told me some interesting stories about that whole thing, man. Yeah. But uh, you know, yeah, Dibble, really... you know, actually, Dibble, uh, Dibble was actually trying to to dominate. You know that set. You know that session they had. You know, mm -hmm. just, you know, just you know all the stuff he played, but he didn't realize. I mean, George just laid right into it, man, as if George was. It's almost like George was showing Benny what to play. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It was, it, was, it, it was interesting, man. It was really interesting to see that. But uh, but then to you know to, to to meet the man later on and get the backstory. Yeah, the backstory. What I need to hear. <laughs> you know? right, well, he, well, he, I don't want to say too much, but he told me that uh, Benny Goodman didn't like him. That's what I was trying to. That's that's the way I wanted to say. What? What he, was, you know, no, so no, he told me this. He told me that Benny Goodman was. Yeah, but, a, you can see it though. I mean, if you yeah. watch that program, you can see Benny Goodman because Benny would look out the side of his eye. But George mm -hmm. all over him, man, just killing. Then he had to go nowhere, but he couldn't go nowhere. George had already laid it out. <laughs> you know yeah, but see, see the thing. See, Benny used to have this gesture when it was time for you, yeah, to wrap your solo up. He would right. raise his clarinet like this, right. And then when he <laughs> did that, that was your cue to stop playing. But George either saw it and ignored it, or he wasn't aware. Exactly. And he told me that he just, uh, he just, you know, just kept on playing and playing and playing. And Benny did not like the fact that this young guy right. was playing all this guitar and it was getting more house than he got. Exactly. And you can see it on the face, Russ. I promise you, if you ever go back and look at that film, you can see it on Benny's face. Like, what? what? <laughs> you know what I'm I've looked at it. I've looked at it. And I, but I remember years ago, you told me about that. And you said, yeah, George kind of went after Benny Goodman. And I was like, no. But then I went back and saw the, um, the, the, the the videotape, and I'm like, man, that's what everyone was talking about. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> what was actually going on. Uh -huh. I, it was so plain to me to see exactly what was going on, because I have seen that before, you know, in, in plays. You know, it, and, you know, back in the old time, we used to call it a cutting session. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's basically, uh, Benny basically wanted to cut Benson, you know, because, Realistically, he didn't, you know, think that much of it. Mm -hmm. George went in there to make a statement, you know. For the yeah. most part, that was the way I was looking at it. George made a statement like, I'm here and I'm here to stay. So, no, he, he he made his point. But I got to say, though, man, Benny Goodman played his butt off that night. But when George got a hold of that, uh, that they were playing 7 come 11. <laughs> Charlie Christian. Mm. When, George got, when George got a hold of it, no, man, it, it was all like, over, man. Done. It was a done deal, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, but Russ, you uh, you said something earlier, much earlier, about uh, you remember the technique for playing in basketball. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you realize this, but today, if you had that technique as a kid, which you did, you know, like uh, say that again. If you had that technique as a kid, as a young person, you know, playing in basketball. Mm -hmm. And then you learn to switch over to C tuning, you know, which is you know standard you know, guitar Spanish tuning. Um, you tend to have a better way of of, of hearing sound. You hear more hum harmonically. It's different, you know what I'm saying, than a person that always played in C. In other words, you have a spirit that the normal guitar player wouldn't have. You can play the same song. But trust me, the spirit itself, just by you knowing it, that's because in basketball, what you had to basically, when you were hearing those kind of chord configurations, they were broader than the C configuration. If you got real deep into basketball, you know what I'm saying? Which is like you said, E thing. And I noticed that every guitar player like that, uh, that I ever run across, they had a real unique way of hearing stuff. You know, they could hear, it's like, it's like a symphony. They hear the, every you know, cello, viola, violin when they play. It's, to them, it's simple, but realistically, it's very different, you know. And you have that ability. That's why your memory is so good. You know what I'm saying? It's the, a lot of it is the cause of it. You know what I'm saying? Which is a good thing. You know? <laughs> they trust. Me. It's a mm. good thing that you can be exposed to that. Because I remember my father teaching me to play that way. To this day, I have a bass that's basically tuned, not in E tuning, but it's it's, it's definitely a, a, a tritone. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And difference in tuning. 
Where when I hear things, I hear them totally different, you know, than a person straight, straight out saying to me. But it's, a, it's an interesting thing that, that, that you said. And um, and everybody I know that has ever played guitar, they were some of the best solo guitar players that I ever heard. They actually started off in basketball. Really? I never thought about that. I never knew that. I never thought about it. But, I mean, it might not have happened to everyone, but all the people I've run into, you know, mm -hmm. that basketball was something, is a spirit that, that they have where the music is colored totally different. Mm -hmm. And and it's a, it's a good thing. You know, it's a feeling. It's all about inside the individual. You know, it's all whatever he is and whatever he's gonna be. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. but, and when they change, and I and I also noticed when they change to a C tune or the, or the regular Spanish tune, they kind of lose that edge. They don't lose it totally. They still think about everything, but to be accepted in certain circles, you know, they have to, you know, they just basically adjust, you know what I'm saying, to whoever's around the plane. That are not accustomed to hearing those chords, and then what it mainly reminds me of is like um, you know, some uh, what was the piano player that just recent guy uh, Harris, uh, Mary Harris. Yeah, you remember yeah. how he used to his his uh, approach to certain tunes, uh, as well as the approach of uh, uh, people like uh, let's say uh, Kenny Barrett or something. That approach, the way they voice the chords and everything in, in the songs that you already know, it, it reminds me of basketball in a lot of ways because they're mm -hmm. playing it. They're not going after it, you know, A minus seven, you know what I'm saying? They're not, they're not going that straight way of getting through the song. This is it's whatever they, it's a feeling that they're playing. So, mm -hmm. in order to play that feeling, you got to have a certain kind of voice, you know, and you got, but you got to hear that voice. In. More so than anything else. And sometimes they used to call it a long time ago, back in Stone Age, when I was coming up, they used to call it, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, they had a name for it. Uh, you, hear, you hear things like that. I can't remember the name, but I remember mean, some old men used to tell me about that a long time ago. But uh, you, would have, you would have that that sound within you, you know, uh, they used to call it false fame, mm -hmm. you know. and uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting that you had mentioned that earlier. But you go ahead and uh, go ahead and continue. Or Vaughn, you want to talk to Russell about anything? I know you do, but Vaughn. Well, I'm I'm just sitting back and you know just watching his expression when he was going back in time, talking about that PBS special that he saw. Yeah, he turned into a, a little young guy. Didn't he? Back into that age again. Right before our eyes, he all of a sudden he went back to 16 years old. And I was like, wow. Oh my God. He was still living in that moment. And that's cool because I was, you know, I would I would be shocked too. I mean, I didn't know about Benson, to be honest with you, until it happened 46 years ago with this masquerade and the album Breezin. Um, I had to catch up with George. Um, I had to do some research because I, once I found out about that dude, I was like, where did he come from? Because my introduction to guitarists in the jazz genre was Joe Pass, uh, Kenny Burrell, Grant Green, and along came Wes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it when when I heard Wes for the first time, I was like, I'm done. This guy here <laughs> was that guy, you know? And so... I've always been, con I, I, you know, it's just something about a jazz guitarist to me that always, you know, they have that feeling for the song through their in their instrumentation. And so, you know, it's uh, to me, a guitar player, especially a jazz guitarist is the most, he emotes more so than any other musician I can think of. Now there are lyricists on saxophones that can do the same thing. But when a, new, a jazz guitarist, you know, you can tell what he's feeling in that song, you know, because he plays with a lot of emotion in it. And it may be subdued. It may be, uh, you know, kind of like frantic in the, in the way he structures it back and forth in the phrasing. But, you know, I'm, I'm a soul. I'm sold on the jazz guitarist. And I remember the first time I heard Earl Klube who is, uh, you know, he's, he's just cemented in an acoustic guitar on the regular, but he's just, you know, he has that, that style too. 
I'm just, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm, 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 you know, I mean, I, I've, I've watched you on a video playing with Herbie, uh, with uh, Hubert Laws and, and, and Jeff Tang Watts was on drums. And this was a special that I was watching. On, I think it was a, a YouTube video. You guys mm -hmm. were in concert somewhere in Europe. Yeah, that was, that was and, a, uh, that was a, there was a, there was a uh, CTI revisited concert. Exactly. Yeah, uh, exactly. In 2009, we were in Europe. Yeah. 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 And that was that that was that was amazing. That was amazing. And I, that was, I just it looked like it. It yeah. looked like it a lot. Yeah. And man, it, was and so so, great. it was great on so many levels. But the thing that was really hip, man, was Hubert Laws and I, we really bonded, man. I got I spent a lot of time with Hubert Laws on the road uh, during that tour. And we still talk from time to time now. And, oh, uh, wow. If you, if yes. you get a chance, go. If you haven't seen this yet, go. Uh, Go to that, go to YouTube and type in sophisticated lady. Okay. We did, we did this really nice duet on a uh, sophisticated lady. It was really nice, man. Wow. Wow. I, and, and just between the you, the, the two of you? Just guitar and flute. And flute. Yeah, man. That. But anyway, I wanted to tell you, uh, you guys, when I was um, back to George after, uh, after seeing him, I um, went out and bought, I made a mental note of, of, of who he was, the name George Benson. So I mm -hmm. uh, had a little job raking leaves. You know, uh, I remember I'm 12 years old and I couldn't work a regular job, so I had to, you know, my little hustle was going around in the neighborhood with a, a rake and a wagon and some and some and, and some hefty long long bags. <laughs> long bags, yeah. So anyway, uh, I would um, rake yards. Well, you know, down in Georgia, you know, in the in the wintertime, there was a lot of pine straw, and there was mm -hmm. a lot of pecan trees, which which had pecan, lot of trees, pecan yeah. leaves, pecan leaves on the ground. So I would go around the neighborhood and. Um, rake leaves and you know I charge like five dollars a yard and when you're a kid a 12 year old kid in 1975 you rake five yards for five dollars you got 25 dollars that's a nice little piece of change for you for a little kid so that money that I made first thing I did was bought myself I bought my first pair of Converse all-star sneakers with that money and then I went out and bought records I bought um I bought two George Benson records, the George Benson cookbook, and it's Uptown. So I would buy okay. these, all these records and I would sit next to the uh, record player, moving the arm, moving the needle back and forth, trying to catch whatever I could catch. Right. And I you know, try to play it to the best of my ability. And then there was a guy in my church, one of the guitar players, a guy named Brother Butch Claude. He's dead now, but we kept in touch until he died. He mm -hmm. heard me trying to play some of the stuff. He said, oh, you like, you like jazz guitar? I said, well, yeah. He said, come by my house. I want to play you something. So I went by his house and he gave me two, he put on two records. He put on Smoking at the Half Note by Wes Montgomery and Boss mm -hmm. Guitar. Smoking at the Half Note was the, it's, it's, it's a jazz guitar classic. The one that Wes did with uh, Jimmy Cobb, yeah. Paul Chambers and Wynton Kelly. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, man, I, when I heard Wes Montgomery, I was like, oh my goodness gracious. And then you know I was listening to these record, listening to these records, and I would read the liner notes, and I came across names like Barney Kessel, Kenny Burrell, mm -hmm, Joe mm -hmm. Pass, who you mentioned earlier, Joe uh, Pass, yeah, yeah, Johnny Smith, all these guitar players. So I went out and bought records by these guys because mm -hmm. I just I, I totally immersed myself in jazz guitar. And then um, I came across names of people who did not play the guitar, but they were very much integral to this music, like Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young, Miles Davis, Coltrane. I bought records by these guys. This is how I got uh, into jazz. I, I, I was sure. totally immersed into this music, man. Yeah, yeah. I still am. It, it, once you get into it, 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 it will it will grow on you. It absolutely oh, will. And absolutely. I guess, I mean, it, to me, it's like those liner notes you see on, like you said, when you get to know liner notes on those albums and you look at these names and you're like, who is this guy? And, and see, that's what I miss sudden, about LPs. The LPs, they, they were so present. I mean, you know, now, you know, I don't even know if they still make CDs or not now, but CDs, they have their place. But there was something about reading those liner notes on those LPs. Liner notes. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I would have, you know, once you, because then you would go back and listen to the, the album again and you would hear him play. And I, you, you know, then you would be like, oh, I got to get this guy because he sounds tremendous on this song. And then you get him and you see him in a solo or he's the band leader and you're like, wow. Mm -hmm. well, you know, and so it just opens up those channels to pursue more knowledge about it, you know. Absolutely. And that's where I've been at ever since I was about, what, 12, 13 years old. You know, it just, I just kept, you know, this is where I went to, you know. And then I started buying, you know, you know, the current day stuff. And, and one, of the, one of those albums that did it for me was when I first encountered the Crusaders and their album Free is the Wind. And I was knocked off my socks, I tell you. Yes, so, yeah. that point on, oh my gosh. I mean, this, I was done. I was done. I said, this is the music for me from here on out. I'm not going back ever again, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I feel about it. But I can't say enough, man, about jazz guitarists. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm caught up. Yeah, Russell, we talked, uh, you and I talked about a little bit uh, and, and you uh, talked about a young man that you knew, uh, that you, you said you communicate with him so often, you know, Dan Wilson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and I was telling you how much he reminded me of when I first met you, you know, saying, <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. without, when, of you, you know, saying he's just a little more laid back than you, but for the most part, you know, you know, he had this, he had that rhythm thing. And of course, coming out of this environment, also the church, you know, uh, which is one of the things that I also had to put two and two together with about a lot of music uh, is that church element in a lot of young, a lot of musicians, you know, whether they're famous or not, uh, when they come up in that environment and if, when they if they channel something musically from that environment, they usually turn out to be pretty good musicians, you know, uh, as far as what you want to feel in a musician or in the music itself. Uh, we can uh, fast forward a little bit. Um, can you tell me, really, what's, what is the scene right now in New York with all this COVID stuff going on for the last couple of years? And how are musicians kind of faring up there on, on, on any level that you know? Well, Edwin, um, a lot of the clubs are starting to open back up. A lot, of them have, a lot of them have shut down, but there are a few that have opened back up um, with limited seating, of course, uh, and, and people are having to be socially distanced. Um, and then there were, for a while, people were doing these gigs um, in the clubs, but there was no audience there. The audience would have to uh, stream right. the gigs on their computers, which, you know, I'd done a couple of those, but I didn't really like it. Uh, there's something about playing to an empty room that feels that, I mean, you just can't really get any kind of, uh, you, we, we need that feedback from the audience. There's you know? a lack of presence is what it is. Yeah, we need that, we need that feedback, man. Uh, but that was, and you need that lady that got up and ran around the church when she heard Yeah, that. you need that kind of thing, you know what I mean? But I, 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 <laughs> I did a couple of those, but I said, you know, I, I really don't want to do this anymore. So I just basically laid low myself until things started to open back up, in which they have uh, to a degree. Uh, because I, I, I love to play, but I, music, this music is social. Music in general is social. Right. You need people okay. there to get that feedback from, man. And um uh, I need, I need, I need the applause. I need to hear the applause. I need to see the people out there in the audience smiling and getting down with it, man. Right. But you, you can't really get the kind of. You can play, but it just gets. When the audience is there with you, it gives you that extra. You know what I mean. It's that, you, it's that instant gratification. Yeah, we need that, man. But yeah. uh, but, but things, things are. I, I gotta. I have a gig coming up. At the Blue Note with Mr. Carter, with Ron Carter, um, coming up next in, in March. So I'm looking forward to that one. And we we done a couple of other things. Uh, like last October, we played in Birdland for a week, mm -hmm. and that was great. And uh, the crowd was good too. So uh, things are slowly getting back together. But then again, there are a lot of things. A lot, like I said, a lot of clubs have closed down. A lot of gigs have gotten canceled. So 
we're just making the most of it. And I don't, I don't, and I'm okay with that. You know, something I learned a long time ago. You don't necessarily have to have the best of everything, but you can make the best of everything if you're smart. So that's what I'm doing. Where were you? Uh, well, I know you were in the city, uh, New York, uh, when you played with uh, when you played with Ron and uh, Stanley Clark and yourself. Yeah, yeah, that was about three. I think it was in 2019. We did a uh, we did a gig at the Blue Note. Uh, okay. But I couldn't remember exactly where you did. I know you did one. Yeah, it was at the Blue Note. Yeah, Stanley Clark was to my left. Uh, Mr. Carter was to my right. And boy, talk about being in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a lot of fun, man. Um, I was I was excited because I had never gotten to play with Stanley before. I'd met Stanley a few times, but I'd never gotten to play with him. And Ron Carter, I've been playing with uh, since 1995. We've been uh, 27 years uh, with Mr. Carter. Man, that's a long time. Wow. Yeah, yeah. but that's that was so yeah. great, man, to, to be playing with both of those guys and Ron Carter in particular, man. You know, and I and, and I've been spoiled, Edwin, because I um uh, I also got to spend some time with Mr. Ray Brown. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I think I remember uh when you left here, uh the night you left, believe it or not, uh, when you left Atlanta, that is, uh, and you went out and uh, what's his name, Ricky? With the guy that Ricky, Ricky Gordon? Yeah, Ricky gave you the, you know, basically one of the elements, I guess, that was getting you to go to that session over there at the head of EJs at the time. Actually, that was Harry Connick. Yeah, it was Harry Connick, but from there you went, that's when you met Ray Brown, right? I, re I met Ray Brown. Okay, let's see. Okay, this is back in 1989 when I uh, joined Harry Connick's man. We went to that, because uh, Harry was in town at um, the EJ. Rock City. No, 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 no. Actually, he was playing a concert at the Buckhead Roxy. Yeah, the concert so, was there, the jam session was at EJ. The jam session was at EJ's, which later changed his name to the Sounds of Buckhead. Right. Because exactly. we, we, we played some gigs there. Right. You and I. Yeah. So, uh, so I met Harry at that jam session. Right. And, uh, and I found out, I'd heard through the grapevine that he was looking for a guitar player for his big band. And so, um, Ben Wolf, the bass player in the band, was the one who introduced me to Harry. And uh, he said, Harry, I got a, um, you know, this, this guy plays good. Because Ben I'd met the first time I came to New York back in 85. First time I took my first, when I first took my, uh, my, my first trip to New York. And so he told Harry about me. And, I, and he, Harry had also heard about me from the Marsalis brothers. Right. So uh, I ended up, he hired me that night. So I ended up joining his band while I was still living in Atlanta. Right. So I was, you know, and, and, and before, now I can't leave this one out because before that I was playing with Jimmy Smith, which was a very important <laughs> stage in my development too, getting to play with Jimmy Smith, man, because that man, in fact, you were the one, I, of course, I remember I used to call you and ask your feedback about things. They don't, call, out, huh? they don't put out too much information. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, hey, Vaughn, I used to call Ed, because Edwin, Edwin, him and a few other guys like Fred Sutton, Freddie, they were like my mentors, you know, because they they, they kind of they raised me musically. I tell him that all the time. Okay. He's like, oh, I Russell Malone. Okay. No, but they were my guys, man. I would I would call Edwin and ask him for feedback. So when Jimmy Smith hired me or uh, expressed interest in hiring me, I asked Edwin, I said, hey, man, what do you think? He said, man, what, are you crazy? Go. He said, Jimmy Smith is an old timer. He's been out here for a long time. And, uh, that's because that's the way, that's the, that's the word you used to describe Jimmy, as an old timer. He's an old timer. He's been out here for a long time, and you're gonna learn a whole lot by playing with him. So, I did it. I called him. I, ca I called him about Harry. And he was like, "Yeah, go, man. It'll be good because you know ain't too much happening for you around here in Atlanta. Go do it." So I did it. And can I? Can I? Can I? I'm gonna interject something about that. Like, I sure. saw you in an interview, and you explained an incident that took place. I know. I know where this is going. Go ahead. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> you and Jimmy Smith. I think I wrote that Ryan Lander, was it? <laughs> no, I wasn't there around. And it was Jimmy Smith. Okay, okay. No, he, but the thing about it was, he kind of like checks you on a on something in well, while y'all were playing. Edwin, you, you remember you remember Pascal's La Carousel? I'm sure you, you remember too. Yeah. Pascal's over. And it was at Pascal's, yeah. It, right. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Was this the one? Was it still on ML King, or was it over there? Off? No, 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 no. It was the original Pascal's on ML King. Right. ML, ML King. Okay. 
Yeah, so I mean, I sat in with Jimmy and I had my girlfriend and my, my little entourage with me that night. And I'm, you know, I'm cadding. And uh, I just went up there and played a bunch of stuff that made no sense, it wasn't musical. So, you know, and, you know, got house from the, from, from the audience. And Jimmy called a tune that I didn't know. He called this tune called Laura. And that's when I found out that I wasn't as good as I thought I was. But that's the, that's the incident you're talking about. Yeah, but, but anyway, he must have seen something in me that he liked because, you know, we, um, he hired me and I ended up playing in his band for two years. Yeah. So that was a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah, yeah that was, that was yeah. a lot of fun getting to play with him. Yeah, but I, uh, but fast forward, I joined Harry's band. Actually, Jimmy fired me when he found out when I told him that I was going to uh, oh, leave wow. his band. I didn't tell you that. I didn't never, I never told you this story yet. Well, got me that one now. So um, when Harry expressed interest in hiring me, keep in mind, I joined Jimmy's band in 1988. Right. I met him in 87, joined the band in 88, stayed there for two years. And so Harry said that he was going to go on tour. He was going to do this record. And then he was going to go on tour and he wanted me to play with him. This is 1990. So mm. I said, well, I'm playing with Jimmy Smith, but I'm going to give my give Jimmy Smith my, my notice. Because the gig... But Harry wasn't supposed to start till like four or five months later. So I figured that would give Jimmy plenty of time to find a replacement. So I called Jimmy and told him that uh, I had this other opportunity that I think might be a good idea to take. And I, th I thanked him for the opportunity. You know, because I said, hey, that was two years that... Um, that were really invaluable to me in, in my in my life. So we hung up the phone. I'm thinking everything was cool. The next day, I get a FedEx envelope from Jimmy Smith. His wife had, had, had written the letter, basically saying, "You're fired. How dare you leave Jimmy Smith to go play with uh, this so and so and so and so?" So I called Jimmy. To find out, well, Jimmy, what's, I thought you and I talked. I thought everything was okay. Joker cussed me out and calls me, called me everything but a child of God, man. I said, okay, well, wow. well he was special, man. Wow. But you know, I, was, um, I did tell you he was old school. You you <laughs> did say that. You said the old timer. He was old school. So he was pissed off that I, you know, the 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 the, wow. the mere idea of me leaving his band to go play with Harry Connick Jr. Right. So. so uh, you know, uh huh. Those two players, they, they based everything on loyalty, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. but I, you know, but we made up later on because I ended up doing a record with him and, and did some more gigs with him after that. But uh, now he was he was he was pissed at me, man. He was pissed. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. Another guy, Edwin. You remember Freddie Cole, right? Oh yeah. That was who I was with before I got in Jimmy's band. I, yeah. I, I, and Jerry Bird. I think Jerry Bird and Jerry Freddie. Bird. Had, had, had one of their many falling outs because they had a bunch of falling yeah, outs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I ended up playing in Freddie's band for a while, and I wasn't I wasn't ready for Freddie, but well, uh, I learned a lot from him though. Yeah, you can learn a lot from him. That's for sure. You know. Yeah, like, I know. Like I said, a lot from Freddie. From those two, you can always learn from him. That's what I told you all the time. You can learn from him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but like you said, uh, <laughs> we all have these. That's one of the things about them. You know what I'm saying? And, and we all, you know. Well, from a certain school that you know you didn't know about that school until you got there. No, that's true. And, and the thing is, yeah. you know, sometimes you can tell people about certain things, but you have to experience it. They say, mm -hmm. like, you know, but yeah, uh, Al, Riley, Al Riley, who we both know, he was he was he was old school too. He was crazy as hell, but he was old school. I mean, man, he was like off the chain. Oh, that Al was something else, man. Did I ever tell the story about Al putting a gun on me? I knew all about that, bro. You know that story? Yeah, well, man. Got that phone, we got the band, I already knew what happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, did I, did I ever tell you why that went down? Yeah, I know why it went down, but you go ahead and speak. No, because he was, he was, I was doing some funny stuff with the money. You know, I, you know, he was doing, so I, and I'm like, because we were playing, we were playing at this place in Houston, Texas for these mobsters, these gangsters. And the gangster wow. guys were cool. They were paying us, you know, they, they, they were paying Al the money, but Al was never, Right, and the band. So me and and, and, and Mike Hughes, who's, who you, I know you know, he's gone now. So we were trying to figure out, well, what in the heck is going on here? And so back then, I'm like 19 years old, crazy, didn't have no fear. 
So I walked up there and I said, hey man, you know, what's going on? Well, actually, I went to the to the uh to the to the club owner first, the mob guy. And he showed me where I and where Al had signed for the money and gotten got, had gotten this money, but we didn't get anything. He said, Well, listen, if you got a problem, young man, you need to go talk to your band leader. Mm. So I went up to L, and he's sitting at the in the club with these women holding court, buying drinks, spending our money. Yeah, right. So I said something to him about it, and he got started, you know, he got all swole. I said, man, I, you know, I, I'll kick your son, 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 son. He said, oh, really? Well, meet me outside. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, now, that was the funny part, because I knew basically what the fuck to him was going Go ahead. So I met him outside. I mean, I take my coat off. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting it together. All of a sudden, Al comes outside with a gun. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, man. I said, like, well, I guess this is it. So he pulled the gun on me. He said, oh, now, who, now, now what was all that? He was, you know how, how explicit Al could be. Now, what was, what was all that stuff you were saying in the club? So uh, Mike said, hey, Al. Mike Hughes said, man, listen, this ain't necessary. So I, um, I turned around to get in the car. And all of a sudden, I hear the gun go off. Al had shot the gun up in the air. But see, I, didn't, I thought he had shot at me. And I'm done to stain my drawers, man. <laughs> wow. that, 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 it was, it was wow. late. It was late at night. It was like maybe two o'clock in the morning, and nobody in the parking lot. It was a vacant parking lot. Nobody but us. So you know the uh, the shot, the gunshot was was amplified. It was yeah. really yeah. loud, yeah. man. Yeah. So, right. uh, but anyway, so we um, they all got back in and went back in the club, and man, I was. That's when I said, "Listen, I can't, I can't, I can't continue with this." So I left. Mm -hmm. And he had all, all the reasons to because Al was a strange person. He was a good guy, but you know what I found out, Edwin? Al had some, he was chemically imbalanced. He had to take meds, and whenever he wasn't on his meds, that's when things yeah. would get crazy. And plus, he was drinking that between oh. the, 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 the Chevis and Seven that he used to drink and yeah. the cocaine he was snorting. That's a deadly, that's a deadly concoction, man. Yeah, man. He was, so, yeah. Realistically, that's pretty much what took him out. You know, so even well, I know, I know, I know. I know. Long, but for the most wow. part, he was, um, he was a different kind of brother. And but you know what's so funny, though, man? We, we made our peace, man. He, he actually apologized to me. And I liked that because he was the one who got me out of Albany, Georgia. Yeah, and see, the thing, but the thing about him was, actually, what he was was, uh, like, like, now they call it bipolar syndrome. Yeah, yeah. And a bipolar disorder, which when you don't stay on the meds, you become uh, Mr. Hyde. You know what I'm saying? The doctor Jack will leave. Mr. Hyde comes up there. Mr. Hyde, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> you never know what's going to happen. But that's what was happening with Al, man. And, uh, yeah, but he was something else, though, man. But you know, man, I, Atlanta, Georgia, man, I'm, if I had to go back and do it all over again, I would, I, 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 I'd do the same thing because, you know, getting the chance to meet you. Get a chance to meet uh, Sultan, Freddie B. I remember we had a lot of fun, man. We had a lot of fun, but I learned a lot too. But we had a lot of fun. But I learned a lot just from, you know, when, when we used to do that gig at Walter Mitty, just sitting at the bar with you on the break, just talking. Because, you know, that, that just that, that, those conversations, just hearing, hearing you, hearing your insight on things, gave me a lot of things to think about back at the time. In fact, in fact I still, hey, Vaughn, I still remember Edwin's old phone number when he lived in the cave. Two one, uh, let's see, four, four, oh, two, yeah, four, 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 that no, I never been to the living room lounge. That was yeah, was yeah. that in Decatur too? No, no, no. It was over in uh over off of, in Atlanta, Georgia, over in the hood on Mason Turner and Stimson. Right, right. But JD oh Morris God. was a, he was a funky, wow. great guitar player, man. But this place was interesting uh, because uh, uh, all kinds of people used to used to hang out there. You you see drug dealers, pimps, hookers, <laughs> and politicians. They all be hanging out at the living room lounge, man. It was kind of like remember that movie Harlem Nights. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah, it was kind of like Harlem Nights. This this place, and it was run by uh, Mister what, what, Edwin. Remember Charlie Boy? 
Edwin, can you hear me? Yeah. Are you still there? Yeah. Can you hear me? You remember Charlie Boy, the guy who, who ran the club? Yeah. Yeah. I never, I never knew his real name until later on I found out his last name was Turner. But Charlie Boy was a, he was a numbers guy, but he was just as cool as he could be, man. Wow. He, he ran this interesting club, man. And we all used to hang out in there. And JD Morris was one of the guitar players. And uh, he had, he could play, he could play some funk, man. I mean, if you're talking about laying down the room, yeah. He was mm -hmm. funky, man. But he mm. uh, he told me one time, he said, yeah, Russell, you play all that jazz, but you need to get with me. I'm going to show you how to play some funk. You need to come to get with me. And then somebody asked him, we were hanging out one night, and somebody asked him if he ever played any jazz. And you know, this guy said the funniest thing. He said, hey, man, if I can't play it, you don't need to hear it anyway. <laughs> that was J.D. <laughs> if, if I can't play it, you don't need to hear it. He was something else, boy. Yeah, you he, died. he died recently, didn't he? A few years ago? About four years ago, four or five years ago. Boy, that dude, was, he was something, but he was funky, man. Yeah, he was the hell of a funk player, man. He was yeah, wow. man. But there are a lot of good men. I met a lot of good players, man. I mean, uh, Reggie Ward, who's from my hometown. Yeah, he's still around. Yeah, Reggie. Oh, darn, he's another funky one. Yeah, but he's working with uh, Fred Wesley. Yeah, no, he's been working with Fred for a long time now. Yeah. Also working mm -hmm. with the SOS band. Okay, yeah, but there are so many great players, man. And I got a lot of good experience playing in various bands. Uh, I worked with, you remember James Earl Jones? Yeah. The drummer? Yeah, I got a chance to, I worked in his band for a hot minute. And, and, and you know, just, you know, just walking or going around town, just getting all kinds of valuable experience, man. And one thing I discovered, because I was, you know, when you first met me, when I was, a, I was a diehard jazz player, but then, you know, being around these guys, it opened me up to other possibilities, other styles of music. And you know, mm -hmm. if you want, if you want to be making a living in Atlanta, Georgia, you have to be versatile because you know you yep. just can't make your living playing solely jazz there. Yep. And uh, I, well, at first, I scoffed at I scoffed at that, but then once I started to uh, do these other gigs and they just hanging out with Edward and all the other guys, the old time was always said, "Son, play it all. Yep. You got to play it all if you want to make make a living. Play it all." And I took that to heart, man. Because the only, only time I had to make money really playing jazz all the time and not have to worry about the R&B was when I was with Dante's. And mm -hmm. I was there for 23 years. You, you, you they get at Dante's? Yeah. Now, were, you, now, when I, when I, when, were you there when Paul was there? Because I, I saw you playing there with John Robinson. Were, were you yeah, there with I, Paul? Yeah, I, I, went, I was back and forth with Paul. Okay. The year before Paul died, uh, I was there. Mm -hmm. so he had Khalifa on drums back then, and uh, and he was bouncing between bass players. Mm -hmm. I would I was on the road, but I would come in and out sometimes to play. But uh, that very last year, though, he uh, he was he was there. I was down in the underground with John, mm -hmm. you know, and and we were uh, we played down in the underground. I guess for about three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then when Paul got sick in 2000, uh, and then John, actually that job was actually, was supposed to go to, uh, well, I guess it went to whoever was, you know, whoever, whoever the last person was. But I think the first per, uh, person that he really was looking for to go ahead and sub for him when he got sick was a uh, Leonard McDonald. Wow, Leonard Pass, I, 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 I heard, yeah. Yeah, Leonard. I like him. And, uh, and, that was who, was, but see, the reason Leonard couldn't do the job was because he had uh, had a job at the embassy suite, uh, mm -hmm. Paul Piano, and he couldn't get off to go and do that once Paul got sick because he was kind of rough, so, so you know couldn't get there. So then they called John to go in there and sub, you know, play jazz, and, and that's how really how he locked in on because he had already played with. He was all John was already in the other. And so they knew that he was already in the underground. Leonard was open when they thought he was open because he Leonard had been subbing for Paul also, you know, doing that doing this, you know, that transition to, between piano players. So Leonard uh, wasn't able to make that particular gig. That's what they called John, you know, to go in there and step in and do it. Oh, okay. Really the, the, yeah. But man, that was so many, so many great players, man. Yeah. Um, and you know, he was such an underrated player. Oh, Who that Leonard? Leonard. Oh, yeah, Leonard. And I tell you another one, man, that I got a chance to get a piece of when I was down there, Oliver Wells. Oh, him, 
Yeah. All the wells, uh, Mose Davis, who I got to play with. Uh, I, I, Mose had a, he had good feeling, man. I liked him. And I see Dan Wall. Oh, yeah, Dan. Come yeah. On, come on, Dan Wall, man. Neil Starkey, uh, right. Rick Bell, Ojeda. Yeah. Uh, Howard Nicholson. Right. Tommy Stewart. Man, I, 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 had, I came up around some good people, man. Yeah, man. I, talk, uh, I talked to Tommy last year. How is he doing, man? Well, he's over in. Uh, he's in Alabama, Alabama, right? Yeah, he's still over there. And he seems to be. I mean, his spirits seem to be up at least over the phone. I haven't been over there or nothing like that to see him, but he, he he's still sharp. He knows, you know, he says, hey, bro, he's right there. He don't say Edward, hey, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And he starts talking, man. Yeah, man. And he's talking a mile a minute, you know. I'm going mm -hmm. like, probably is still talking. <laughs> you know, nothing else has changed, you see, man, other than the fact that he's uh he does dialysis like three times a week. Okay. And, uh, but, but, you know, Tommy is pretty up there at age, you know, but yeah. still sharp. His mind is still sharp, you know. Yeah, he was a great musician, man. That was some great musicians down there, man. You remember Doug Hudson? Oh, yeah, I talked to Doug two weeks ago. How old is it? Doug must be close to 90 now. I'm pushing it. He just turned 95. Doug, 95? Yeah, he just oh, turned 95 last, for the last week or the week before. Uh, but but he just turned 95, you know, as a okay. third reason. And I talked to him on the phone because I wanted to get him also on one of these conversations with Doug. And he, man, Doug got some serious history behind him, you know? Uh, yeah. I learned a lot about Doug a long time ago with the people he worked with and all this kind of stuff and some of the people he was in the army with. You know, and Doug was one of the first cats here in Atlanta to join the union when it was still segregated. You see, Is that was, right, man? That's going yeah. back a ways. Yeah, man. No, that was 19, I think you said 40, 44. Yeah, I didn't realize he was that much that far up in age. You know, another cat, man. I know you know him, Edwin. Another guy that I got a chance to uh, to get to know, man, Layman Jackson. Remember Layman? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah man, that I, guy I, was him too. Me and Layman's oldest sister live our uh, neighbors. We actually, she actually lives two doors down from you. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, you remember his wife, Abby? Do you remember I, 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 I never met Layman's wife. Okay, but anyway, Abby, uh, she died also. Okay. And, um, and that? Like, the, like you say, it's a, that would use your button. And Layman, uh, who's that? Um, uh, Kat uh, wrote a book. Uh, I can't remember what his name was. But anyway, when Layman, back in, in his younger days, when he was working with Donald Byrd, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, I remember him telling a story about Donald wanted him to go down to Philadelphia and pick, you know, Donald wanted him to go down to a Penn State, sorry, and, and pick up a, a, a young musician, you know, young guy coming in uh, and play piano. And uh, I remember Layman telling the story, but when, I, when it was actually written in a book, I think uh, Donald Bird wrote it. Uh, that piano player that he had to go pick up was from Kirby Hancock. Kirby Hancock, yeah. Yeah. And uh, Donald, uh, I mean, uh, but Layman was telling the story. You know how Layman was, man. Layman, Layman would be talking, but he talking trash all at the same time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's telling you stuff, but he's talking trash at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he had a lot of history about himself. And I remember me and Steve Ellington talking a lot about it. You, know, you remember Steve? Of course I remember Steve, yeah. Yeah, Steve, 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 Steve and used to talk and bounce off of certain things, you know. But uh, it was like, like I said, like you said, man, it was a lot of a lot of cats here, you know, that was really hip cats and had, had been around, had already been around. And you know, there were a lot of clubs, man. You remember uh, that was a, when I first got to Atlanta, man. There was a club down on International Boulevard called Claude's. You remember Claude's? I used to play there. Yeah, man, that was a yeah, nice club, man. For like a, about a year and a half. You know? Say it again. Stayed there for a year and a half. Yeah, man, that was a nice right. club. And that was a lot, lot of good singers too, man. Remember uh, Liz Fraggins? Yeah, she's over in Alabama. She teaches over at the uh, uh, what's that school over there? The college. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, the HBCU. She teaches over there. Okay, it was Liz Fraggins. Remember Elaine? Elaine Garrett. Remember her? Yeah, remember her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bernadine Mitchell. 
I don't know what never happened to Bernadine. Then there was a Liz Lance who passed. Liz Lance who passed, exactly. Now, Bernadine, uh, I got her to do one of my uh, events with Jazz Matters uh, about four or five years ago. And that was the last contact I had with her. I think yeah. she hired pretty much went into seclusion. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. to know how to get in touch with her or nothing like that, you know? Yeah, I haven't, I've lost contact. I, 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 I don't know what whatever, whatever happened to her. Hey, remember Jimmy Jackson? Remember Jimmy? Yeah, yeah, Jimmy. Yeah, we lost him too. Yeah, Jimmy, we, we worked in Jimmy Smith's band together. Right. When I, right, when right, I first right. got the gig with Jimmy Smith, Jimmy Jackson was the drummer. Right. And as a matter of fact, when Jimmy uh, came down to Dante's one night and he did it, I think he did his first CD for you know his own type of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, for his own CD. He came down to Dante's and uh, said, I'm here, man. Here's a CD that I just did. Here's my new CD. And I said, really, man? And I said, uh, and so I, I reached in my pocket to give him some money for it, you know? And uh, he said, oh, no, I don't want the money. I said, trust me, man. Take the money for the CD. You're not in here to give him money. You, you're trying to make some money, you know what I'm saying? Take it, take it, take it. This, this money. And so, so he of course, he took it, you know. And then uh, I think he moved to DC. Um, last time I saw Jimmy, he was in DC. Yeah. That's right. And that's where he died up there. Yeah, man. That's a, what, what a loss, man. That was another guy I, uh, while you were talking. There were two guys who had, uh, who popped into my head. Remember Sill Austin? Is he still with us? No, Sill. I was doing a game with Sill, man. Sill had a heart attack on stage and died. Say that again? We were doing a New Year's Eve game. Right? And they put together a band, you know. We went up in, I think, it was Roswell, somewhere up in there. And we were on stage and still had just bought, well, he, not just bought, but he bought a horn about two or three weeks before that. Mm -hmm. but still never told anyone that he had a heart attack, right? He also never told anyone in the band, that is, that the doctor told him not to play the horn anymore. You see? So he came in. I remember the first game, the weekend before that, he played, and uh, he showed us a new Mark 7, a new silver Mark 7. And he was so proud of that horn. He got out there. You know how he used to stand playing his horn? Yeah, yeah. He got out there. He was playing his horn, man. He was proud of that horn, man. Next week, we did a New Year's Eve gig. And uh, you know, everybody, I think Dub was on that gig. And, and, uh, Still got up through his solo. Still did his solo. After he did the solo, man, he turned around and he fell. You know, and I was thinking that that new horn, you know, I'm saying he didn't drop that new horn. And uh, they couldn't revive him, so they had called him out, man. He, you know, he put you, 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 you witnessed this on stage? Yeah, I was in there. I was playing. Oh, man. Mm. Oh, boy. That was still, that was man. Mm. He was a nice man. Yeah, he was a nice man. What about uh, what about Josh Seabrook? Remember Josh? I don't. I heard he was still around. I haven't seen him since ooh, back in the day. Mm -hmm. I heard he was still around. I just believe it or not saw where uh, you remember Upshaw Melvin? Melvin Upshaw is he still with us too? Yeah, I just saw a thing uh, yesterday. That was a bad cat, man. I mean, great horn player and great keyboard player, man. I remember him. Yeah, I saw him with a trumpet in his hand, so I, I assume he I never, I never saw him play the trumpet. Yeah, I never saw him play it either, but I said, I said, knowing him, he probably learned how to play it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, But I saw him, and he, he sent me a friend, uh, friend request, Facebook. I said, okay. You know, I said, I said, man, I hadn't seen Melvin in so long, so I clicked on it. And then I saw his current stuff, you know. And mm -hmm. yeah, he's still around, man. He's, he, he's more in the church, you know, doing things. Yeah. But but he's still, I mean, he's still a musician. He's still playing you know. That was a talented dude, man. That was a talented yeah. guy. Yeah, extremely talented. Yeah, Vaughn, we talked about cats around here that were really those cats uh, who didn't have, if we weren't, weren't able to get it be in place when the opportunities arrived. Right, right. They were great right. musicians, you know. And yeah. Some of them, <clears throat> not only were they not in place, some of them, it is a mental thing also. You know, mentally, you got to be ready for that kind of stuff, too. So whatever right. that's going on, um, you know what I'm saying, that way is one of the other reasons. You know, but me and Vaughn, uh, Russell, were talking about for well, every uh, every every great musician that you know, 
that you know of, that you heard of, seen, all that good stuff, it's all good. There's always a musician, I call it coming out of the fields, that did not have that opportunity around them, but will blow your mind on just the fact that they're so talented you can't figure out why is it that this cat is not being recorded or something like that. But it's just the environment. You know, you know who else is like that, man? Remember Eddie Davis, the trumpet player? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what well, me, man. And, and mm, Eddie still, mm. you know, that's the whole thing. You know, he's still me. He's still just as fluent as a trumpet player. He lives in Virginia now, and he's been there for a long time. But mm -hmm. he kind of withdrew from the, you know, certain, you know, uh, places. Like, you know, I, I know his mom had passed away and he came down for that thing. For the most part, I have not seen or heard from Eddie since. Now, I can tell you who can talk to Eddie at any time, and that's Terry Smith. Oh, man, Terry. Yeah, yeah, I like Terry, too. Terry, man, I met him at the living room lounge. Now, Terry was supposed to be doing the thing with us earlier today, oh, yeah? but Terry <laughs> flipped on us so many times before we got here, we couldn't even use him. You know what I'm saying? Like, right. you know, he put his own self out of the interview. I ain't never seen that before. But, you know, hey, that's what it is. <laughs> that's all it is. But, do y'all think it, do you think it was temperament or just, it just the timing wasn't just in their favor? I think it was fear. <laughs> About a lot of people that happens to. And yeah, you know I, I what their mentality fear. is. And it's just like, wow, I can't believe he went off the deep end like that, you know? And they never achieved any manner of, of success, you know? You know, and there's nothing, I can't take anything away from their, you know, what they do locally or regionally, but when you, you know, those opportunities don't come around too often. And you just, you just know they're talented, you know what they can do, you know, and it's just like, wow, what, yeah. what happened? You it's know, it's either yeah. lack of the environment or, or, or I guess opportunities are just not there with the car. Right, right. Right. And things come you up know. the other end where you may not be in that position. Say like Russell, for instance. Like if Russell had never left Auburn, but yet he's still as much musician as he is today, mm -hmm. he wouldn't be in the session. Right. So there's a environmental it, issue that, that has to happen. And then you have to be you yeah. have to be seen by the right people. You know what I'm saying? It's got to be one that you don't be seen. You're you going to be seen, yeah. So once you move yeah, to the see. what you got, you're going to be seen. It's almost like James, mm -hmm. James like, like you talk, you said something, uh, like, like James Jameson. When he left, when James Jameson left South Carolina, right, he was really trying to get out of those fields, right? So, <laughs> like everybody else. So when he left South Carolina and went to Detroit, you know, about him still being a bass player now, he would have never got seen if he had never done. You know what I'm saying? He would not probably never know he existed. You know what I'm saying? And his sound. The music scheme on that part would have been probably totally different today. Mm -hmm. But what he bought there changed, you know? And every time a person relocates, they tend to change the history of music to a point. You know, they don't change the whole right. history, no. But there is a, is, a, is, a, is a link there where they do change in some direction the music, history, the culture. And that's kind of that's kind of cool because uh, I think that, like in Russell's situation, and you can tell me if I'm right or wrong, Russell, it was inevitable, I would think, because of your, your mentality, your spirit, to make the change. You see what I'm saying? That's the way I saw it, even when you were a kid. You had, and I remember telling you, I said, man, you got to get out of here. You know what I'm saying? You got to go. You know what I'm saying? I used to say that a lot. You don't need to be. Because I had been on the road and all that stuff, and you, I remember you asking me, you said, well, why didn't you stay? I said, well, I had family to come back to Kansas. And I decided to make that move to raise the family here. You see what I'm saying? Of course, it could have been somewhere else, but all that, you know, wasn't the case. But that's what I wanted to do. Whereas in your situation, you had pretty much everything was still open just like that, and you got a chance to actually work with these musicians, Got a chance to know them, play with them, and then you got your name in the, in the, in the, in the, in the uh, on the roads to, to do things. But it was your decision to stay out there. It was not your decision to come back and say, "Well, I have enough." 
you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you didn't have enough, you know what I'm saying? And there's still more to come. So you gotta absorb all that stuff, you know, right? Mm-hmm. right in here and make sure that you know you're doing the right thing and you straight from that. And I think that's true with all of us. You know, we all had to make those kind of sacrifices. But one uh, one more thing getting back to the session here. Plus, what do you think? Uh, who who are you are you listening to now? Nowadays, um, just about every, every every. You know what I like to listen to, man. I like listening to vocals. I love listening to good singing. Um, and there's several good ones out there. The one that I've been uh, I, mean, I, I put on this recording a few days ago of uh, this recording of Sammy Davis Jr. Oh, this guitar, it was a duo record with this guitar player, Mondale Lowe. I've been listening mm. to him. Um, I listen to tenor players. I love I love the horn, man, the tenor, the tenor sax. Uh, Dexter Gordon's one of my favorites. Oh, hey, you gonna get your sax, man? Are you gonna huh? Pick, are you going to pick up one? <laughs> no, no, no. But you know what I do is to uh, I listen to these vocalists and these other instrumentalists to try to um, to get the phrasing, especially from the vocalists. Right, right. Even, even when I learn a song, if I learn a standard, I always get the a vocalist rendition of it. Right. And uh, somebody like Nat King Cole or Sinatra or Ella Fitzgerald, somebody who doesn't deviate too far from the melody. Right. And but I I, I really admire the way that they phrase. That's something that Freddie Cole used to always talk to me about. Right. Phrasing and getting the, um, trying to get that vocal and lyrical quality, lyrical quality in yeah. my plan. So, and, uh, and I love Freddie Hubbard. Freddie Hubbard, um, there are a lot of great trumpet players who have come down the pike, but for me, Freddie Hubbard, that's my favorite, man. I, I just love to, to listen to him play. I got to play with him one time. I had the good fortune to play on his, la- on his last recording. Oh, okay. it was a lot of fun. Mm. Yeah, Freddie was something else, man. I mean, even when he had lost his lip, right. lost his chops, just standing next to him on the bandstand was still scary because he was still Freddie Hubbard. He still had the music yeah. in. Him, so and he's right. and he and the man still he heard everything, man. So you mm. just hope and pray that you don't play anything stupid because Freddie <laughs> he, he heard everything. Well, how was it when you when you were working with uh, uh, Sonny Rollins? Though? Because that right there was another thing, another kind of thing. You guys didn't even use a piano player, did you? Not when I was in the band, no. Right. And, and, I, and I asked him about that. Listen, okay, I'll tell you a story. When I first, because I knew that Sonny wasn't too keen on you and using piano players right. later on in his career. So the first gig, I guess I was a little too overly exuberant because he played this tune and after he played the, the melody, he started to t- play his solo and he just started to explore all of this harmonic expo- exploration. And I'm trying to catch him, you know, trying to go with him. Right. So I remember this particular night, he took, the, when I was doing that, he took the horn from his mouth and your son used to wear those sunglasses on stage, right? So he took the horn from his mouth and shot me a look. I couldn't see his eyes, but I felt the vibe. I'm like, uh oh. So he just looked at me for like maybe a, a couple of seconds and then he went back to playing. So after the gig was over, I went by his dressing room as I would do from time to time, just to ask him, you know, if everything was okay. So uh, uh, he told me this night, I said, hey, was everything okay, Mr. Rollins? He said, listen, one of the reasons why I don't use piano is because I feel that sometimes the piano can just can be to can clutter the landscape harmonically, so to speak. I opted for guitar because it's not as dense as the piano. So what he was telling me to just leave him more space. And he told me, he said, listen, you know, I never know where I'm going to go. So what I need you to do is to just lay down a sparse and simple backdrop so that I can extemporize. That was his favorite words. I can extemporize. And so I said, well, shoot, man, you Sonny Rollins, I'm going to give you whatever you need. And so the next gig, I did exactly what he was asking for, and he never said anything for, to, to me about that again. And I stayed with him for a year. Right. But that was, man, let me tell you something. I have not heard that much horn in my life. <laughs> Lord, and I played with a few of them. I played with, you know, I played with George Coleman, who's another Titan. 
Yeah. And a few other ones with Sonny Rollins and Jenny Heath to play with him. But Sonny Rollins, that's a whole other ball game, man. And I remember one night, man, we were uh, we were in Japan. And he played this tune, man. Sonny must have soloed for like maybe 10, 15 minutes, as he's known to do sometimes when, when, when he's feeling like it. And I'm thinking to myself, I said, Lord, Lord, do not let this man motion for me to solo after this because there's nothing that I can do or play or even think about that would even come up to the standard that he just dropped. So he just kept on playing. And I'm like, no, I don't want to play after this one. And mercifully, after his solo, he took it out. I'm like, Phew, thank God. Yeah, but he was something else, man. But uh, no, you know, the thing that I miss about that gig more than the music, man, was the conversations with Sonny Rollins, because he's a very fascinating guy to talk to. Um, he could talk about anything, you know, any any subject. There's not a subject that you could bring up that he wouldn't be able to expound on. So just being around him and uh, just hearing his take on life, on music. And he would always talk about Oscar Pettiford. I know you know about Oscar Pettiford, that one. He would always talk about Oscar Pettiford. And he would always talk about uh, Colvin Hawkins and Lester Young and Clifford Brown. And he told me that uh, Clifford Brown meant so much to him because Clifford was such a nice, clean living guy who lived in an, exempl an exemplary life. He said that Clifford was the one who really inspired him to clean his act up. So mm. just you know, just hearing him talk about uh, about about those things, man. And uh, yeah, he he's a fascinating man. And boy, he could play. Oh, he could really play. So, that's so, like that's like saying the Pope is Catholic. <laughs> no, really. So, but but have you seen him since? Uh, have you been able to talk to him since? I talked to him a couple of times after uh, I left the band. But he's a son. He's not playing anymore now because he's got some health issues, some wow. respiratory issues. And uh, the last time I talked to him, he was complaining about his hip. And I said, uh, well, why don't you get a hip replacement? And he was um, he wasn't too keen on getting a hip replacement because he said that he didn't want to have to deal with the the recuperative process. But I haven't talked to him since then. But we've we've seen each other messages. I would send messages, uh, a couple of messages through his publicist, and he'd get back to me. But he's basically a recluse now. He told he only talks to a few people. Before, before Jimmy Heath died, him and Jimmy Heath they talked every day. Right. I was this man, but. Uh, yeah, he was a man. Boy, whew, Sonny Rollins. Interesting, interesting man. Nice man. Have, have, have you been able to uh, stay in contact also with uh, a couple of other people you work with, like Harry and, and Yes, Diana, yeah. Diana. I just saw Diana not too long ago because I was in the hospital, had some, some things that I was going through back in September. Diana came by to see me, and Harry called me. We, we, we talk every now and then, yeah. So I'm still in touch with a lot of a lot of them. Well, Bob, anything else you want to say before we get out of here? I just want to say, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to let you know, Russell. I, I'm a lover of our culture. I love our culture, and I sit back sometimes and I wonder. I feel so special and, and fortunate to be here in this situation because, you know. You know, you're a child of the 1960s. I'm a child of the 1960s. So, and Edwin is Edwin. You can wave back. You can wave back there. <laughs> Get me and Moses. You notice I didn't hang no decade on Edwin. He's he's Edwin. So, with that being said, your stories, your authenticity, your honesty and truthfulness about what you have experienced in your life. It's extremely important to the culture of jazz or all musics for that, all of the genres of music for that matter, because I have to go back to, you know, I can't even, when, when I first met Edwin, all I knew was jazz from him, but Edwin has been on the Chitlin circuit too. And it's like, you got to take the gig. Versatility is your key to success. Um, and I, you know, I don't try to, I'm, I, you know, although jazz is my thing, I grew up with all types of music as well. I don't particularly, you know, push away none of that stuff that I used to listen to. I remember when I was a kid growing up, my grandmother listened to adult contemporary music. 
you know, I heard everything from Montavani to Percy Faith. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my mom loved Dubusse, uh, uh, du you know, Tchaikovsky, Chopin, Beethoven, uh, Mozart. She loved all of that stuff. She wanted to be an opera singer. My dad, Lead Belly, B.B. Uh, 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 King, Bobby Blue Bland, um, all of the blue singers, you know. I grew up off of Motown, Stax, uh, Philadelphia International, um, Kurtom Records, Atlantic, you know, uh, uh, the, the Mississippi Delta and all of that stuff down there. See, I'm more than the sum of my parts, but yet still, I love the culture that you guys have lived in and participated in. Um, and I just wanna say, I, 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 you can't imagine what type of thoughts are going through my head right now, because your stories are, 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 are legendary. You touch, you touch the spots of those legends that created this stuff. You've been right alongside of them. And, and, and you know, you're very honest and truthful. And, and you, 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 you talk about the good times, the moments that made you laugh, the, the, the realizations that a lot of our, those greats are gone, you know, and what that means. So, you know, and, and I'm up in age now where it's like, I wanna do something with this. And I just wanna share this with you that I'm embarking upon uh, uh, with a group of people out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, that want to do their own jazz museum, basically from the belly of the slave ship. So, and I'm, you know, as a broadcaster, they want me to help put together their radio station. And I'm looking forward to this because I feel like I'm commissioned to do this. This is what I've been commissioned to do from the, from the, from the steps I've taken in my career. It's led me to this. And you guys add to that. I mean, you, I just, I can't say this enough. I mean, Edwin has told me these stories, countless stories about his, his life on the road and being in the studios and being on stage and stuff. And what you just said is just reinforcing all of that stuff. And Edwin and I have done over 50 of these interviews and you can, I'm just like, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. And the beauty of it is, there's a lot more that I'm, I'm listening to and I'm ready to hear it all, you know. That's how I feel about it. I just, I just wanted to express that, you know. Um, I, you know, I, I fell in love with radio back when I was in junior college, and 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 I've been in it ever since. So, I got a show on the radio station, and and my music is it, it does it. It's a it's a smooth jazz radio station, but I convinced the, the program director you can't do smooth jazz if you don't know where it's coming from. I just believe that. It has its place because it's still part of that big oak tree that all this music is about, but it comes from somewhere. It just didn't spring up in the 1980s. It comes from somewhere, you know? So that's what I try to introduce. It's, I, I, it's about the, the culture, you know? Betty Carter said it best to me, jazz ain't nothing but soul. And that's yeah. how I look at it. It literally is soul. And nobody, everybody talks about jazz, jazz, jazz. That wasn't a word we created. It didn't come from us. That's not anything we hung on that music. I only call it soul because soul is who we are. Literally, it came from our souls, the souls of our ancestors. And, it's, and, it, and it continues to have that. You know, you talk, you from, you're from Albany, Georgia. Edwin's from North Carolina. You talked about uh, um, uh, uh, James Jamerson from South Carolina. When they got up north, them folks up north didn't know nothing about what the kind of soul the Deep South had. We all migrated in the second migration from the Deep South to all across the country. And we've changed this nation three times over because of the soul that came out of the South. I mean, it is what it is, man. And we have to accept that. I mean, it's almost like we can't get any recognition for it. But you know what? That's why I'm doing what I'm doing with this museum. So we can get that respect and honor. And, and just, I'm not looking for any uh, 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 approval from 
the powers that be, but recognize uh, game got game. And we've had game in this country ever since. So, you know, as a broadcaster, this is what I got to do. And I just wanted to express that to you, man, because, you know, you, you, you've, got a, you've got a great track record in the, from, your, from, from your experiences, and you got a long slate ahead of you. I just can't wait. I'm going to stand back and I'll watch you do what you do. Well, hey, That's hey, all Bob, I got to say. Hey, Bob, when we, uh, when we, uh, when, Bob, when you get the museum over there in uh, Oklahoma City, I want you to put up, erect a, a giant bronze statue of, of Russell, the tower. <laughs> <laughs> Look, in that, way, stand, that, that bronze statue, will he, he'll be alongside Wes and Charlie. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And, and Kenny Burrell and right. Joe Pass and <laughs> he's yeah, gonna be right up there with us. Yeah, you gotta put it in now. When they, when they get the thing open, now, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna check it out now. It, it better be there. Right. I don't know, man. I'm gonna have to go over there and do some, you know, put it out on glass or something. You know. Look, I, look. I'm gonna hold. I'm, I'm y'all hold me accountable. Don't let me miss out on nothing. That's how All I right. look at it. With that music. All right. Cool. Cool. All right, Russell Man. Uh, is there? Um, you got any new projects that you're doing? I know you uh you've been working on a new solo album, right? Yeah, I went in there and did some things, and I'm gonna go back in there and redo some stuff and add some more things to it. So uh, oh, okay, so stay, stay when, tuned. When, okay, so we can we look at it what in the next month or two? No, it's gonna be a little more further down further down the road than that. But uh, I'll I'll keep you posted. Yeah, do that, man. Because uh, I saw where uh, there was something you did. Uh, what was it? Uh, little solo piece uh, that you did, I think it was back in 2019. Something that I put up on Facebook? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I like to do that every now and then. What you was know. that? I, mean, I, I put, put up a few of them. I don't, I don't remember exactly which one that was, but I put up a few of those things on Facebook. It was, so. a, it was an original tool that you wrote uh, for, and I, I can't remember who it was you wrote for, but it was one of your original songs. And uh, I can't, like I said, I can't remember which uh, artists you did it for. Something of me playing? Yeah. I don't remember that one, Edwin. Uh, I don't think I've ever put up one of my originals uh, on social media. Oh, somebody else did. <laughs> you know. Could have been, yeah. Somebody else might have put I tell you what, it, was, it came off of a, uh, and I could tell it was an older photo, old photo, because it, it just basically had to be. Uh, with the guitar, and, uh, and I knew it was an old photo because you, you know you, had, you still had your hair, and but it was a uh, just a, a, a solo piece that you said you put on for uh, another position that you had admired or something. Hmm. I don't know if I, I should have checked it and everything a little bit deeper to see exactly who posted it. But it yeah. And anyway, but listen, gentlemen, this has been great, but I gotta go because I'm having dinner with my lady later on. And I gotta get so, showered and now get, you're fighting nobody but okay, we okay, we we'll, we'll pick up the rain check. You know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. But this was great, man. You know, I don't do too many of these things, but you will you when you asked me about it, I said, Well, yeah, I'll I'll talk to Edwin because he's he, that you know, was this, this is a fun conversation. Yeah, when you said, you know, how long did I teach? I said, well, I don't know. You know, I just wanted you to just talk what you did. You know, just talk as long as you wanted to talk. You know, you got the platform. You got the, you tell us when to go so we can go. But yeah. is there any place that, uh, uh, any, uh, anyway, people that's, that want to contact you for whatever on social media? Website yeah. Website, um, website Russell, Russell, RussellMalone.net, the website. And then uh, you can find me on, I'm on, on at Russell Dot Malone on, on Instagram, and uh, you can find me on Facebook. Okay, got it. Now uh, you can uh, go ahead and uh, let Bond go ahead and give you those spots that he's that you can catch him on. Jazzbeatsradio.com, Jazzbeatsradio.com, and, and Von Coulter at dot um, A N B S. Ain't nothing but soul at gmail, I'm sorry, at hotmail.com. 
I got, I got so many emails. Von Coulter dot a n b s at hotmail dot com. And of course, I'm Edwin Williams. You can get me at yesjazzmatters dot org. And like I said, go uh, click on the donate page and subscribe to us and like us also. So Russell, man, we're gonna let you get out of here because I know how it is. I feel the I feel the burn too for the hunger. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm getting ready to go in out of here also. But thanks for showing up, man. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thank you. Nice to meet you, Vaughn. All right, nice to meet you. My pleasure, sir. Thank you. All right, All right. you guys take it easy. Hey, why don't I be calling you, man? Okay, thanks, man. All right, later. Bye.